Coming up on Market to Market. Preservationists document the history of the American farm by listening to those who remember. A rare display of unity in Washington results in a multi-billion dollar project to shore up U.S. ports and improve flood control in the grain belt. And the bulls continue their historic run in the livestock sector while grain prices plunge to contract lows. Those stories and market analysis with Elaine Cub and Walt Hackney next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, June 13 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. America's agricultural sector occupies a bright spot in an otherwise gloomy trade picture. The government predicts ag exports will soar to a record $149.5 billion this year, due largely to strong foreign demand for U.S. grain and oil seeds. According to the USDA, every billion dollars in exports supports nearly 7,000 U.S. jobs, and the shipments contributed to the livelihoods of nearly a million workers last year. Agriculture's contribution to the economy is one of the few things policymakers agree on these days. And this week, an all-too-rare display of unity in Washington resulted in a multi-billion dollar project to improve U.S. ports and improve flood control in the Grain Belt. Waterways across America will get a facelift after the stroke of Barack Obama's pen. The president approved a $12.3 billion bill this week aimed at improving historic ports and enhancing flood control in the Corn Belt. As more of the world's cargo is transported on these massive ships, uh, we've got to make sure that we've got bridges high enough and ports that are big enough to uh, hold them and accommodate them so that our businesses can keep selling goods made in America to the rest of the world. Uh, meanwhile, many of America's businesses ship their goods across the country by river and by canal. So we've got to make sure that those waterways are in tip-top shape. And, and this bill gives a green light to 34 water infrastructure projects across the country, including projects to deepen uh, Boston Harbor and the Port of Savannah and to restore the Everglades. Uh, and with Congress's authorization, these projects can now move forward. What was important for... This bill enjoyed bipartisan support from congressional leaders as the language contained no pet projects or pork traditionally included in spending bills. The price tag was half of a similar measure approved seven years ago. The legislation authorized the diversion of the Red River in the Fargo-Moorhead area, which has dealt with several major floods in recent years. Cedar Rapids, Iowa also will receive money for flood management. Coastal communities were allocated funds for hurricane and storm damage reduction, and environmental restoration is also included in the law. All of the improvements were recommended by the Army Corps of Engineers, and the rare instance of congressional compromise sets the stage for nearly three dozen projects over the next decade and may help pave the way for approaching legislation. The fact that this bill receives some bipartisan support, uh, I think hopefully sets a pattern for additional work that we can do uh, on our transportation infrastructure. We need a transportation bill by uh, by the end of this summer uh, in order to make sure the projects all across the country don't get shut down. The 70th anniversary of D-Day last week reminded Americans of the more than 400,000 soldiers who made the ultimate sacrifice in World War II. Those who returned, returned to America and helped build a vibrant post-war economy. And that's especially true in rural America where the greatest generation embraced innovations like hybrid seeds and transformed American agriculture into the envy of the world. Some are concerned, however, that the same advancements, allowing fewer producers to farm more acres, have doomed the pastoral idea of the American farm. But an important program in the heartland is working to preserve that legacy by listening to those who remember. 
Paul Yeager explains. Barns, the symbol of American agriculture, are disappearing from the rural landscape at an alarming rate. Time takes its toll, and structures that were once vitally important in daily farm operations often fall into disrepair and are either torn down or collapse. And as the iconic buildings fade into history, America also loses a way of life. It's important to preserve the really unique in the everyday. Um, because when you look back at our life, um, you know, it isn't just about uh, the church or the theater. It's those everyday places that we spend our days uh, that we want to remember what our daily life was like, right? And the work we did. And so one day, 50, 60 years from now, I mean, the world we see, most people are going to, it's going to be a distant memory of. And, and so we need to have some icons to kind of give us a glimpse back. 200 years ago, 90% of the population farmed. Today, it's just 2%, and the average age of those that farm keeps increasing. According to the 2012 Census of Agriculture, 57% of those who farm are 55 years or older. To broaden what is already known about a disappearing way of life, Iowa silos and smokestacks, the only historic district in the country devoted to farming and industries related to agriculture, and the Grout Museum in Waterloo are working together to compile oral histories from people involved in farming. I think the 1930s to the 1970s is indeed that greatest generation for, for farming because they had gone through so much, the depression in 1921, the depression of the 1930s, uh, the really hard times, particularly in the mid-30s. Uh, then coming out of that, World War II is this tremendous boom period. 70s, you see this explosion of farming, followed by those horrible 80s, which, you know, just devastated folks who had expanded a bit too much, had taken too many chances, and uh, were overextended. And the farmers that I talked to, they talk about the 1980s and they say, you know, we should have known that. You know, we should have known that because the same thing happened in the 1920s and to some extent it happened a bit in the 50s. But we didn't learn. We didn't remember. Over the past century, there have been revolutionary changes in agriculture, technological advancements and how seeds are both planted and harvested. The innovations have enabled U.S. farmers to produce 262% more food with 2% fewer inputs than what was grown just 65 years ago. We need to be able to tell, particularly school kids, what the life was like 40 years, 50 years ago and how a farm might look today. And so by engaging people with stories, we get that attention from them that they might not give a panel on the wall that they had to read. According to Niemeyer, farmers are great storytellers, and it's often difficult to limit their conversation to just two hours. If I try to pull the emotions uh, of of what it means to be a farmer, but we also want to get the facts, okay? I mean, you know, as, as Fred Strobin was talking about this morning, you know, he could sort of tell you it took X number of minutes to pick by hand, you know, and, and now you can do it in, in virtually no time at all. Back in the 30s, we only got, we didn't have hybrid seed, we didn't use any fertilizer, and we only expected to get 40 to 60 bushels a acre. Gradually, there were a few people who would brag about 100 bushel corn, but those people that got 100 bushel corn, either they lied a lot or they had a lot of, of uh, they might have a, a dairy herd and they might put uh, 10 tons of, of cattle manure on, the, on their per acre. That way they would get enough nitrogen they could. We like to ask the question, what will farming be like in 10 years? You know, 10 years ago, we would have said, what would the farming be like in 25, 30 years? Because we thought it was going to take that long to change. Now we realize that in 10 more years, farming will have changed so much. You know, and the older farmers, they have some sense of, of 
why things have changed, and you have some opinions of whether it's good or not. Uh, now the new combines, and, and uh, you pretty much stay in the cab. And when you got some of them, even if you get out of the cab, the machine will turn itself off, and, and which is a good safety factor. Live as though you're going to die tomorrow. Farm as though you're going to farm forever. It's easy in today's world to take agriculture for granted. But from 1933 to today, the population of the world has grown from 2 billion to 7 billion. A farmer somewhere raised most of the food you eat, produced at least some of the materials used in making your clothes, and even helped fuel some of the nation's 253 million cars. While advancements in agriculture have left an indelible mark on virtually every aspect of modern life, it's still important to preserve crucial parts of the American experience, whether they are barns or vivid stories of how things used to be. After all, History never looks like history when you're living through it. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. Next, the Market to Market Report. Grain prices plunged Wednesday after the government surprised the trade by increasing its estimates on global supplies. The market bounced back later in the week, but not enough to offset losses in previous sessions. For the week, July wheat lost 32 cents, while the nearby corn contract moved 12 cents lower. Heavy fund selling pressured old crop soybeans as the July contract settled with a weekly loss of 31 cents. Nearby meal prices followed suit, giving up $19.70 per ton. In the softs, cotton rallied this week for the first time in recent memory as the July contract gained $2.20 per hundredweight. In the dairy market, July Class 3 milk gained 57 cents, while the deferred contract improved by 32. It was an unbelievable week over in livestock, where, with prices already at all-time highs, the August cattle contract gained $5.53, August feeders advanced by a whopping $7.63, and the July lean hog contract added to last week's rally with a gain of more than $2.00. In the financials, the euro lost 10 basis points against the dollar. Crude oil prices surged to a 10-month high with a gain of $4.18 per barrel. COMEX gold advanced by $24.40 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index gained more than 15 points to settle at 660.15. Here now to lend us their insight on these and other trends are two of our regular market analysts, Elaine Cub and Walt Hackney. Folks, welcome back. How are you, Mike? I'm doing very well, and it's an exciting week. We've got a lot of news that broke this week, both on the grain side and on the livestock side. And Elaine, let's take a look at the wheat market first. Uh, we've continued to see this sell-off, 32 cents on the week. Is it still burdensome supplies just pulling this market down? Yeah, absolutely. Any any bullish thing you could say for the U.S. wheat supply, and in fact, you do hear bullish news from the harvest reports. There are some very terrible yields being seen in Oklahoma, 10, 15 bushels per acre being harvested, and they're just now getting started into Kansas. You could even say maybe India is starting to get a little bit dry if you wanted to nitpick some sort of northern hemisphere weather concern. But all of this is, like I said, nitpicking when you're dealing with this much cushion of supply. There's just plenty of wheat around, and feed grains in general are on a very bearish slide. As we take a look at this, slide, how much farther can we slide on uh, these, some of these nearby months? Yeah, looking at the Chicago wheat contract as a benchmark and looking at it alongside corn, you know, it's been on about a five-week slide of, let's say, six cents per day, sort of average pace, uninterrupted fall down. And you could continue that for another week or so before you started to hit like a 550 level where the September contract might start to see some buying support on the chart. And that would be right alongside corn slide, maybe another 25 or 30 cents too. And remember that in two weeks from now, there's going to be the June acreage report. So I'd say this next week or two is the time frame to see hopefully some sort of bottom being put in. Has the trade started to anticipate what we're going to see in that acreage report? How should producers be setting themselves up in advance of that? 
Well, the expectation and, for instance, Informa, which is, a, which is an influential private estimator, they came out with some numbers uh, today regarding what USDA might do for acreage. And I actually am really on board with what they're thinking there is perhaps a slight increase in soybean acreage, perhaps 300,000 extra million 300,000 extra acres adding on to the 81.5 million acres that USDA last weighed in on for soybean acres. And that makes sense when you consider that there has been some localized lateness, some wetness in the northern plains. They're on track now and they're certainly going to catch up and get all of probably all of their soybean acres planted in North Dakota, Wisconsin type of areas. But there may have been some slight amount of switching from corn to soybeans that may be a bearish factor when that comes along. Okay. Well, let's take a look at the corn market. One of the big pieces of news this week was uh, China's announcement that it will be no longer accepting American DDGs due to concerns with the uh, MIR-162. Yeah. We saw that uh, be a bearish factor yeah. in the corn market this week. Where do we go from here? What does the trade anticipate with China's ongoing hmm, yeah. concerns? Well, that, that, you know, I want to point out that overall, this does not affect the global demand, supply and demand of feed grains. You know, they're going to have to come up with that with that feed somewhere. And obviously they want to be directing that demand to their own local corn market rather than U.S. DDGs at this point. But frankly, that may shake loose and they may come back to the U.S. DDG market when it is no longer convenient for them to have caused this ruckus. But it was a ruckus. And you're talking some DDG markets lost maybe 20% this week, within a week. That's a, that's a huge move. And soybean meal followed along because why would you pay extra for soybean meal when the entire feed grain market is falling apart like that? So it may be kind of short term for DDGs, but I, I don't think that fundamentally that changes the, the equation for corn. Now, for advice for producers out there, as we've been watching this sell off on the old crop side, if anybody's got any corn left in the bin, mm -hmm. what do you do? Well, like I said, you know, just on a chart based matter or on a time frame matter, you might see another 25 or 30 cent slide. But there is strong demand for ethanol. Feeders are certainly able to be making money uh, with this is cheap enough feed, relatively speaking, historically speaking. So I don't think that there's going to be a bottom falling out here. I'm not bearish in the sense that I'm looking to see much more than 25 or 30 cents shaved off from this point forward. Now, as we take a look at new crop, we've got a question here from one of our Market Plus viewers. He sent in the question on Twitter. Uh, it's Chad in Randalia, Iowa. He's asking up in his neck of the woods, northeast Iowa, new, new crop cash corn price is nearing $4. Um, is there any hope for a rebound on the new crop side? Sure. I mean, it's very early in the season. Um, all all aspects point to probably good growing weather. They say there's a better than 70% chance that we could see an El Nino form in the next couple of months. That tends to be very supportive of U.S. grain yields. So we could see above a trend line yields. I mean, we could have U.S. average yields, you know, well above 162 bushels per acre. That's a possibility. And if that happens, I would expect to see bearish or neutral movement through the summer. But if something else happens, uh, any sort of weather thing could have a small rally or you could have short covering. The managed money has been adding in short positions to both the wheat and the corn markets for the last couple of weeks. And at some point, uh, they may run out of sellers and have to turn around on that. For new crop uh, producers, is there any price level that, uh, that looks appetizing on the new crop side? It does not look appetizing to me to sell new crop at this point. Hopefully, you had some sales made seasonally back in the March and April time frame. And hopefully, you've got storage so that if you get some sort of a, a weather rally, an El Nino rally for the South American markets, perhaps in the fall, you can store it away long enough that you could take advantage of that. All right. Now let's take a jump down and look at uh, the soybean market. We still have exceptionally tight uh, old crop soybean supplies. Uh, USDA, I believe, tightened us again here this week. Now, we did see another 31 cent fall yeah. this week in soybeans. In their WASD report this week, they didn't tighten any of the demand categories. They tightened a beginning beginning stocks category, uh, which I think the market was disappointed because there is all of these reasons to expect some sort of tightening in, in that table, and they may in upcoming months. Um, but yeah, I think that the, the fall we saw this week was perhaps just a disappointed bulls that didn't see the bullish changes that they wanted to see in that in that June Wasi report. Okay. Now on the uh, on the new crop side, it's the same question. Planting's through. We've still got decent weather. New crop beans have held up reasonably well compared to this old crop sell-off. What should producers be doing? What's uh, what a, what's a target out there for them? Well, honestly, you know, this is the one market where you could be selling now at profitable levels. It doesn't look appetizing to sell corn now, but you could be selling new crop soybeans and locking in a profit. So if that has not been done at all, that's something a producer might want to be looking at. 
But if it has been done, again, you might be able to, uh, to, to sit by here for a while because there does seem to be chart support at $12 on that November chart. So there may be some room for this to, to bounce back up as time goes on. Bounce back up and then maybe catch a, a weather scare, an yeah. opportunity to make some more sales later on. Any sort of small rally, yep. All right. Now let's take a jump over to the other sector that caught some press this week in agriculture, which was the livestock side. Now we heard uh, DDGs fall in price and we saw feeder cattle move up a little bit this week. Well, talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing in the feeder cattle markets as you're out and about in the countryside. First of all, the, <clears throat> the volume, the availability is um, an issue with cattle buyers, cattle feeders. Um, there's, a, um, there's a feeling among cattle feeders that we have a very limited supply due to the four-year drought in the Southwest, the Midwest, the West, and the liquidation of the cow herds over that period of time has created a, a serious um, um, shortage of that crop of feeder cattle availability. That's, it. That's both yearlings and it's also the fall calves coming up now in October, as an example. Um, the western states actually had more snowfall, they had more rainfall going into the winter months and into the spring than they did in the southwest. The, wet, the southwest still uh, experiencing a drought, however, within the last week, why they've picked up moisture down there enough to give them some hope for summer grass, and uh, but there's still liquidation going on. So your point, Mike, is what caused the extreme run-up in the feeder cattle? Uh, to be quite honest with you, uh, it's rampant. The uh, availability of cash and possibly the uh, liquidity of the cattle feeding industry is such that they're not recognizing the risk exposure that they're presenting for themselves in the price of these feeder cattle right now. Um, you made a comment about record prices, uh, granted, but it's record on top of record on top of record on top of record. And any time that you buy a 600 pound feeder calf, as an example, unweaned off of the cow, October delivery, your risk factor goes through the roof. And that's what we're looking at as we speak. It doesn't seem to deter the majority of the cattle feeders. They're after the volume of the limited supply, and that's all they think about. Some of the more astute cattle feeders that are looking at their risk exposure and how to offset that are finding that there's very few ways that they can ex uh, offset that. So they're opting to go with empty pins in a lot of cases right now. They're not going to expose their liquidity in their operation to the potential of an extreme bust if it would occur. Who knows? No one knows. And that's the unknown that's causing the problem. Now, you mentioned a lot of the confidence on the part of cattle feeders. We have been seeing fat cattle trade relatively steady in that 145 to 150. Where do you see that fat cattle market headed here over the short term? I don't find any reason to think that it's going to be anything but in the vicinity of the price range you mentioned, a buck 45 to a buck 50. We sold cattle today in Nebraska. Uh, those cattle were a buck 51, a buck 51.50. Um, <clears throat> those cattle are making um, anywhere from 250 to 350. $350 a head. And that's not a very good deterrent to a guy that's wanting to replace an empty, empty pen of calves or yearlings. Mm -hmm. But the fact remains, you've got to eliminate that, maybe put that equity in the bank. 
maybe hold it until a better day. Because right now, if you really sit down and a lot of the, uh, in a joking matter, Elaine, they'll say if you fed the calves corn for nothing, they'd lose money. Mm. Well, that's not a very good excuse for buying the calves, is it? Don't be going to the auctions with a full wallet, you yeah. know, maybe. But they're doing it. All right. Now, as we take a look at the at the pork side, at the other white meat here, we've also seen that come up a little bit. Uh, indication that uh, consumers are still out there buying and staying in that, that hog market, it looks like. Well, they are. And then <clears throat> the PED virus that affected the pig crop going into this year uh, particularly. Um, at first, the industry thought, it's been overstated a little bit, the death loss. We don't have the 10% death loss that had been anticipated. Then again, all of a sudden, it looked like, well, we do. Now it looks like that we're going to have a general shortage of market hogs through the third quarter. All right. At the end of the third quarter, however, then the guesswork really starts. All right, we'll talk about this more in the Market Plus segment. Thank you, Walt and Elaine, for being with us today. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Elaine, Walt, and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in our Market Plus segment online. You'll also find audio podcasts and streaming video of our program, as well as links to our Twitter feed, Facebook page, and the rest of our social media outlets exclusively at the Market to Market website. And be sure to join us next week when we'll examine controversial laws that some say restrict free speech down on the farm. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.